After watching this video, you should be able to describe the autonomic nervous system anatomy with a focus on comparing the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Now we're going to look at a variety of different things. Preganglionic and postganglionic neurons, where the somas are located, axon features, and the neurotransmitters that are released. We're also going to look at the receptors involved for the ANS found on postganglionic neurons as well as the effector organs. So let's review our autonomic nervous system schematic. So we have our preganglionic neuron cell bodies found in nuclei in the central nervous system. Their axons project to a postganglionic neuron where they release a neurotransmitter on a ligand-gated excitatory cation channel in that synapse. And those somas of the postganglionic neurons are found in the peripheral nervous system in ganglia. Their axons then project to an effector organ cell release the neurotransmitter on a G-protein coupled receptor at the neuroeffector junction. And remember that the effector organs include cardiac cells, smooth muscle cells, which would include either multi-unit or single unit smooth muscle, and secretory glands. So now let's turn our attention to the autonomic nervous system. We have the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions, which we're going to be comparing. And then it's also good to include the somatic motor system because it does share some similar features with the autonomic nervous system, even though it's not part of the autonomic nervous system. And let's start with the parasympathetic division. And the cell bodies of the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons are found in two locations. The brain stem, which is comprised of the midbrain, pons, and medulla, and the bottom part of the spinal cord called the sacral spinal cord, specifically sacral segments 2, 3, and 4. Now the axons coming out of the central nervous system are going to be found in two major locations, either in cranial nerves, and the cranial nerves that we have to consider are cranial nerves 3, which is the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 7, which is the facial nerve, cranial nerve 9, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. And the axons that are in those cranial nerves that belong to the parasympathetic system are preganglionic, and their cell bodies will be coming from nuclei found in the brain stem. The sacral spinal cord preganglionic neurons, they exit initially as sacral spinal nerves coming off the segments S2, 3, and 4. One point about the preganglionic axons is that there's limited branching. That is that one preganglionic parasympathetic neuron does not innervate many postganglionic parasympathetic neurons, and that helps explain why we have a more limited focused response with the parasympathetic system. Now the neurotransmitter release by the parasympathetic preganglionic neurons is acetylcholine, shown here in green. And the excitatory ligand-gated ion channel receptor that it binds to is the nicotinic cholinergic receptor of the neural subtype. And that's written here as N subscript N. Now that's an excitatory receptor, and it's going to excite the postganglionic parasympathetic neuron cell bodies. And those are found in the peripheral nervous system in ganglia. And the two major types of ganglia that we see are terminal ganglia, which are very close to the effector organ, or you also can find them within the walls of the organ, and those are called intramural ganglia. And that explains why the parasympathetic preganglionic neuron axon length is relatively long compared to the postganglionic parasympathetic axon length, because those parasympathetic preganglionic axons have to travel a much longer distance to get to those postganglionic neurons found in these ganglia. Now, the neurotransmitter that's released by the parasympathetic system primarily is acetylcholine, again shown in green. And like we said, the effector organ has G-protein coupled receptors that it's going to use to have an effect on that effector cell. The two types of cholinergic receptors that we find on effector organs are primarily of the M2 and M3 subclass, muscarinic 2, muscarinic 3. And we have written here the types of G-proteins that they're coupled to. The M2 receptor is coupled to GI, and the M3 receptor is coupled to GQ. Just want to also point out that some parasympathetic postganglionic neurons can release other neurotransmitters and other molecules, but that's not shown here. So the take-home message is that we have two junctions here for the parasympathetic system, and we need to remember that this is mostly cholinergic and cholinergic. The difference is the receptor, nicotinic 
is used for postganglionic neuron transmission and muscarinic transmission at the neuroeffector junction. The sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic cell bodies, they're found entirely within the spinal cord, specifically thoracic 1 to about lumbar 2 spinal cord, and therefore the axons are going to be found in T1 through L2 spinal nerves. One other point about the preganglionic sympathetics is that there's lots of branching as opposed to limited branching for the parasympathetic system. And that explains in part why we get a more diffuse response of the sympathetic system when the sympathetic system is activated. The neurotransmitter released by the sympathetic preganglionic nerve terminals is acetylcholine again. And the receptor, like we would expect, is a ligand-gated mixed cation channel. And it, again, is a neural nicotinic receptor. Now that receptor, when it gets activated, is going to excite the postganglionic neurons, and those cell bodies are found in two major types of ganglia. Paravertebral sympathetic chain ganglia, which is a, a paired structure that's adjacent to the spinal column, and we also have unpaired prevertebral ganglia. And the relatively close proximity of the paravertebral and prevertebral ganglia to the spinal column explain why most of the sympathetic preganglionic neurons are shorter than the sympathetic postganglionic neurons. The axons of the postganglionic sympathetic neurons, when they fire action potentials, the nerve terminals are going to release primarily norepinephrine, and it's going to therefore bind to adrenergic receptors, which are G protein coupled receptors and primarily the three receptors that we need to think about are alpha 1 which is coupled to GQ, beta 1 which is coupled to GS, and beta 2 which is coupled to GS as well. There's also a little bit of alpha 2 and also beta 3 on effector organs but we're just going to focus on these three as they're the major receptor subtypes found on effector organs. Now there is something special that we need to consider for sympathetic and that is some of the postganglionic neurons can release acetylcholine, which is labeled here with a star, and in that case, it's going to bind to a muscarinic 3 receptor, just like we had acetylcholine above in the parasympathetic division, potentially binding to an M3 receptor. Now where this is occurring is on sweat glands. So when the sympathetic response causes an increase in sweating, the postganglionic neurotransmitter that's released is acetylcholine, and it's using the M3 receptor. There is another special feature about the sympathetic nervous system that we need to point out, and that is that the preganglionic neurons, instead of going to a postganglionic neuron, can also go to the adrenal medulla, which is the inner part of the adrenal gland, and these cells, called chromaffin cells, are embryologically related to the postganglionic sympathetic neurons, except that they don't have axons, they're no longer neurons anymore, and they have an additional enzyme that can methylate norepi to make epinephrine. And so we see here that when acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic receptors on the adrenal medulla cells, most of what comes out is epinephrine, and there's also a little bit of norepinephrine that goes into the circulation where they can serve as hormones. So this is another reason why the sympathetic system has a more diffuse response. Once these hormones start circulating, they can act on all these adrenergic receptors and give you a widespread response. The other important consideration for this endocrine component, it is also allows the sympathetic response to last a little longer because as these hormones are circulating, it does take time to clear them from the circulation. Finally, we have the somatic motor system, which is shown at the very bottom. And remember, this is not part of the autonomic nervous system. This is for voluntary control of skeletal muscle. So the cell bodies here are actually called lower motor neuron cell bodies, and they're found in the anterior horn of the spinal cord all along the length of the spinal cord, cervical to sacral. And the nerves coming off the spinal cord then would just be in cervical and sacral spinal spinal nerves. These lower motor neuron axons release at the nerve terminal acetylcholine onto a nicotinic receptor, but it's of a different subtype. It's of a skeletal muscle subtype. And this junction is called the neuromuscular junction, as opposed to the neuroeffector junction that we see for the autonomic nervous system. And once this receptor is activated, you get a depolarization of the skeletal muscle, which ultimately leads to an increase in sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium which then causes skeletal muscle contraction after the calcium interacts with troponin on the actin myofilament. So in this system here, we're not showing how the lower motor neuron was activated. We'll show that in another video, but there was another neuron from above called the upper motor neuron 
that was exciting it. And that concept is the same general idea for the autonomic nervous system. These preganglionic neurons do not initiate anything. They have to get various inputs from other neurons to control their activity. For example, there's a variety of reflexes that control the parasympathetic and sympathetic preganglionic cell bodies as well as descending tracts that contain sometimes what's called pre-preganglionic neurons that have to go down through the spinal cord to contact the sympathetic preganglionic cell bodies as well as the parasympathetic preganglionic cell bodies located in the sacral spinal cord. And now you should recognize that the acetylcholine transmission is very common. We see it in between pre- and post-ganglionic neurons of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. We see it between the pre-ganglionic sympathetic and the adrenal medulla, which belongs to the sympathetic nervous system. We see cholinergic signaling for the parasympathetic neuroeffector junctions. We also see acetylcholine for the sympathetic neuroeffector junctions on sweat glands. And we also see acetylcholine signaling at the neuromuscular junction. So we see a lot of green here. And we also see that we have nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors to keep track of and where they are and what they do. We can see for the adrenergic signaling, that is primarily at the sympathetic neuroeffector junction only. And that concludes this video on autonomic nervous system anatomy comparison of parasympathetic, sympathetic divisions and the somatic motor system.